Hi folks, welcome to Rainforest Flora and once again today we're going to talk about some beautiful blooming Tillandsias. You know the winter time is when they most bloom. Uh, their life cycle is to grow as an offset or a seedling and they, when they mature they bloom in the winter, they get pollinated, the seeds uh, develop and then with the faster growing species the seed pods need to dehiss, they need to pop open and the seeds will come out and blow around and land on things and then the rainy season starts in the spring and summer and the seeds start growing. If the seed pods open too late and the seeds are sitting there and the rain hits they get stuck on the mother plant they don't really have a chance to go anywhere. So winter time is a wonderful time for the blooming of Tillandsia. We have some here for you today to show you and one of them is a Tillandsia Recur, uh, recurvifolia, excuse me, Tillandsia recurvifolia. This one is in the finishing stages of blooming. Uh, this one is just starting. And this, these two plants aren't pure recurvifolias, but they are, um, have the, the blood in them, so to speak. They are very similar. And you can see they're more in an intermediate stage uh, from the beginning initial stages of this one and the finishing stages of this one. You have usually about three weeks to a month uh, from the time you see it starting to come out until the time that it starts fading away. And then of course after it does fade away, that's fine too because the plant will start producing offsets and the offsets will grow up and it's really fun to watch them grow. They're pretty fast, they grow up for the next year and then they flower and that cycle continues until you develop large clumps. And people ask all the time, uh, can I separate them? Well, of course you can. Uh, you can separate them where they attach. You can use a sharp knife or scissors and, and just cut them away from where they're attached and, and you can have individual plants that way. However, I want to caution people that normally individual plants are much more available than large clumps. It's the large clumps that take years to produce and are very spectacular to look at. So if you can, you might want to think about just letting it grow into a clump and then purchase single plants separately. So that's the recurvifolia. Uh, this is another interesting, uh, two similar looking plants. Uh, this is a species in my left hand called Floribunda, and in my right hand, this is a hybrid called Tushi. Tushi is a hybrid of Shidiana and Juncia. And you can see that they're very similar. You don't have to pay any attention to my cell phone. Um, <laughs> This is the way it is, right? The modern life. Uh, but anyway, really cool plants and very kind of similar the way that they look. And then another one is Tillandsia stricta. Uh, this is a you know one of the favorites of people because the blooms are so showy, and you can see in nature that hummingbirds will come and they'll come up to the flowers like this. Uh, we have one flying around in here somewhere up today. Maybe I should I should hold it for a while. Maybe he'll come by and do a live action shot for you. Um, but uh, anyway, this is a, a clump that started from one plant two or three years ago, and now you can see it's turning into a nice grouping of Tillandsias. Uh, this is a really cool one, if I can separate them there. This is called Tillandsia arauge. It's a Brazilian species, A-R-A-U-J-E-I. And it's uh, very difficult for most people to pronounce or to read, A-R-A-U-J-E-I. Um, but the way nomenclature works in naming is that you pronounce the name the, the way that the person from the country that it comes from pronounced it, or who oh, it's named after, I'm sorry. And this is named after a guy that, whose name was A-R-A-U-J, and the E-I, the suffix on the end. And so in, in Portuguese, they would say uh, Araújo. So this would be Araújo, Araújo. Uh, it's a gorgeous plant, it's been growing for a number of years. You can see this fabulous inflorescence on it, and uh, and it just would hang like this, and it just keeps growing along. And when you have a plant on a stem like this, that's that's coalescence, and so this species would be called coalescent because it grows on a stem. Stricta does not grow on a stem. Arauge does. Uh, another great species is um, this is a cultivar called Bobosa gigante, and Bobosa gigante gets to be much larger than the normal form of bulbosa. And this one again, it flowers in the winter time. And you can see that it's changing from this green to a much more beautiful orangey red color. 
This will continue to turn color. The inflorescence is just starting to come out. It'll get about this tall. Have branches on it, uh, bright purple flowers, and uh, hummingbirds can't resist it, and neither can people. It's just too beautiful. You know, I mean, it's a fabulous plant. Fabulous plant. You can get them small and then grow them over three or four years to a large size. Uh, the big ones aren't as available yet, but they are becoming more and more available. And here's another interesting contrast um, of two similar looking hybrids. Uh, this is Tillandsia PJ and this is Tillandsia Sunset Glow. And Tillandsia PJ is a hybrid of Iantha and Concolor. And Sunset Glow is a hybrid of Caput Medusa and Brachycolis. And you can see they have you know, basically the same shape. The uh, con color Ionanth combination here has more leaves on it. Medusa does not have a lot of leaves. But the Medusa is also just getting ready to flower, which is why it's turning red. And of course, red Tillandsias are irresistible. Everybody wants red Tillandsias. If there were red Tillandsias on demand, uh, we'd all be retired by now. <laughs> um, but Tillandsias generally are not colorful. Uh, they have colorful inflorescences, or the plant can turn red when it flowers, but generally they're not colorful. Um, they have fabulous shapes, they're very durable, and they can grow with no dirt. You know, how cool is that? You can take these and string them together and hang them in the air and let them grow, and you'll have living mobiles everywhere. So, I have a another one. Oh, I want, I'm going to show you this in a minute. Here's a, uh, a piece of grape wood. It has a Tillandsia Lucky Lady, which is uh, con color and zero graphica. It has a Stricta. It has an Iantha hybrid and, uh, and a small Tillandsia fasciculata. But this is a piece that we glued the, uh, the plants onto the piece of wood with the tilly tacker. And, and it's indicative of the, the ways that you can, uh, the ways that you can uh, mount the plants to make an attractive presentation uh, besides just hanging them in the air. You know, you can put them on anything. People say, can I put it on uh, my seashell or can I put it on my roller skate or something? You know, whatever. <laughs> and I tell them, hey, they'll grow great on your bedroom mirror. You know, it doesn't make any difference. What makes a difference is light and water. They need light and water. And if they're in an environment where they get wet and they don't dry out very quickly, then they need air movement as well to keep them dry in between their waterings. They don't want to be soaking wet for very long. So, you know, a lot of this information, folks, you can find on our website, rainforestflora.com. We have a, uh, a section on there that has a lot of the growing information and background information on the plants. We also have a booklet, the Genus Tillandsia booklet, that was first printed in 1977. We're in our 15th or 16th edition now, and we're in between editions. Uh, we're out of it right now, but in another couple of, well, within a couple of months, we're hoping to get the new one which will be larger and have will have more pages and beautiful photographs and so much information on where the plants come from, how they grow, how to mount them, how to take care of them indoors, how to take care of them outdoors and all of that. So keep your eye out for that on the website. And lastly, um, I wanted to show you, here's a, uh, a Tillandsia white star, which is Ixioetis and Stricta. And you can see the leaf edges on this one are curling up. And that's what happens when a lot of these plants get too dry. It means that they weren't watered frequently enough, or they were misted and they gradually dried out. And the leaf edges curl up like this, and when that happens, you have time, up to a month maybe, but you need to put it under water overnight to rehydrate it. And if you do that and you take it out in the morning, you'll be amazed at how much more full the leaves are, how much less curled the leaves are. Uh, it's a it's just a magical way to rehydrate the plants. If you don't know that, of course, then they're going to either stay like this or they'll dry out even more and gradually die. So this is important to notice in your plants if the leaf edges start to curl up. And I have the book here. Uh, Barry just handed me this. Uh, this is Tillandsia II. This was uh, issued uh, by, uh, five years ago now. But uh, this is the most complete way to learn about the Tillandsia. It has beautiful photographs of many, many different species. This is a picture of a fountain here at the nursery I just happened to open up to. Uh, there's a Streptophila and a Tectorum. Uh, there's Albertiana. There's the Bulbosa. Um, so many different species. 
Uh, this is a, a, a monstrous form of Ionanthus, very rare and very beautiful. And there's Ixioides. Anyway, there's a lot of pictures and a lot of information in this book. So this is for those of you who actually want to learn a lot and, and have an ability to uh, appreciate more and more uh, these most marvelous plants, these most marvelous works of nature. Uh, there's a chapter on the people over the centuries who named the plants and what their careers were like and uh, very interesting people. And this is going backwards now, back to the beginning. And you can see all these different people. This was the first printed reference to a plant that would someday be called a Tillandsia. This was in 1623 by a guy named Bohin. And this was the first printed reference to a plant uh, that was named Tillandsia. This was uh, Linnaeus in 1737. There was a guy named George Clifford up in Sweden who had a bunch of plants. He didn't know what they were. And he called uh, Linnaeus and said, hey, can you come over and tell me what I've got? So he did. And this beautiful, beautiful book called Hortus Cliffordianus came out of it. And on one of the pages, Tillandsia is named for the first time after Elias Telons, a Finnish botanist, that, that, uh, that Linnaeus named it for him. And this is where Tillandsia starts in 1737. The genus was erected in 1757. And then all these guys over all these, and gals, over the centuries named the plants and up to down to, to people today like Renata Ehlers and Walter Till, uh, Harry Luther who unfortunately passed away a couple of years ago, and Derek Butcher. Uh, people who are fascinating in their own right and who are intimately and actively involved in the promotion of and the naming and the taxonomy of these plants. So there you go. And the last chapter is on the evolution and biology of the plants. Uh, this is the nomenclature chapter. And Anyway, there's all this stuff in there and I was just going to show you the the introductory, this is the introduction to the uh, evolution and biology of the plant. So there's a lot of information besides a lot of pictures. And in the back, I hope this isn't going too long for you, but uh, here's a, uh, this is the glossary. And in here somewhere, there, uh, there's a color chart so that you can match the colors of the blooms uh, or you can read the, the names of the colors of the blooms in the book and you'll know what they look like in real life. How's that? Thank you very much for being with us today. We shall see you guys next time. And uh, Happy New Year. Bye-bye.